On today's show, the Atlanta Hawks nearly blow a 12-point lead in the final three minutes, but they were able to escape with some helpful free throws from DeJounte Murray at the very end of this contest. We'll get into all of what transpired, what was good, what was bad, and what was uh, even ugly along the way, but still a nice win for the Hawks. And we'll dive into all of that and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1372 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Rowland, coming to you on a Monday evening into Tuesday as we get closer to the end of December and the end of 2022. And I appreciate you diving into the podcast with me on this fine Monday into Tuesday and also making us your first listen each and every day. Check us out across podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, Odyssey app, all those fun places, as well as uh, on YouTube on the video side. And today's episode is going to break down a win for the Hawks, which is always a positive thing if you are a Hawks fan, but certainly not one that was uh, terribly exciting at the end, at least in a good way. Um, after the game, lots of mixed reactions, but still the Hawks won this one, 126 to 125 over the Orlando Magic. And with the win, the Hawks are above 500 again, 16 and 15 for the season, and they're now 10 and 5. Actually, a pretty impressive home record for Atlanta at State Farm Arena, um, but still. Uh, Definitely a challenge, and if you saw this game, you'll know what I'm about to get into now, but the Hawks gave up a 13-0 run late in the fourth quarter to give up the lead. And it was up by 12 with three minutes to go, and it was not safe at all. They managed to escape with the victory on DeJounte Murray's game-winning free throws with, with about a second and a half remaining, but uh, nothing was easy along the way in this one, and we'll kind of get into all of what transpired as well as the offense, the defense, Trey Young's big night, et cetera. And uh, again, thank you for listening to the podcast. We'll get into the game now as far as the pregame specter was concerned. The Magic came in at 11 and 20. And if all that's all you knew, they, obviously the Hawks would be favored in the game. They're playing at home, et cetera. But Orlando has won six games in a row. They've been playing very well. Um, that was a little bit fluky if you looked at sort of the opponent level data and the shooting stuff. But they did beat the Hawks, of course, soundly last week. And they beat the Celtics twice in a row. So certainly a, a, a better opponent than you might imagine, given their record overall. But it wasn't back-to-back with travel for Orlando. So if you thought they might lose their legs in this game, uh, that would have been a reasonable assumption based on the travel they had. It didn't really happen on the stretch. But um, on the Hawks' side, they haven't been playing all that well necessarily, but they were, they were much healthier in this game than they have been in a very long time. In fact, DeJounte Murray and John Collins both returned in this game. They were upgraded to questionable on the injury report on Sunday evening as I sort of broke on the live on the air with Glenn Willis. And by the way, that episode is still very relevant at this point in time. So if you missed it over the weekend, I talked to Glenn on the podcast. That's episode 1371. And I definitely encourage you to download and subscribe and listen to that show as well as everything else, everything else in the archive. But um, Collins and Murray upgraded to questionable. They both were able to play in this game. Collins missed eight games. He came back 18 days after the Hawks told the media and the public that he was going to be out for, quote, at least two weeks. I tried to stress at that point. It was like only going to be two weeks. It was at least two weeks. It was 18 days. It's a pretty normal timeline there. Uh, DeJounte Murray missed only five games. The team said in that release it was, it was going to be approximately two weeks. So not, not at least, but approximately. It was only 11 days there. In fact, after the game tonight, um, Nate McMillan said just plainly it was a different injury. Still, it was they were both ankle sprains, but Nate kind of framed it very differently between John and Jante. We probably won't get any more detail, detail on that, but um, for the short version is Murray was not limited in this game, minutes-wise, and Collins was. Keep that in mind along the way here. Click, Click Apello is still out for the Hawks. Um, Jarrett Culver was in the G League as the Hawks. We're going to have to choose an active player anyway because um, for the first time in a while, they actually had almost their whole roster available, but um, 14 guys active for the Hawks in this game. Orlando was largely at full strength, although some guys that have been at least somewhat key. One of Card Jr. is their best, uh, their best center. He's been out for a while for them. Uh, Jalen Suggs, Gary Harris, etc. But their core guys that were winning the last six games were all available in this one. And uh, kind of funny, our friends at Bell Line made the Hawks an eight and a half point favorite in this game. That's a lot of points for a team that has been playing as well as Orlando has. But given that it was back to back, all that stuff, I'll say this is kind of an ominous note. That I shared before the game even started. This is the largest point spread for the Hawks as a favorite since they faced the Hornets on October 23rd. And if you remember back, back to that game, the Hawks lost that game in like by 15 points at home. So uh, they won this one, but they did not cover, let's just say, along the way. Um, at the top of the game, actually, though, there was a surprise starting lineup for Atlanta. And uh, I actually asked about this after the game. Nate McMillan kind of gave a little bit of clarity on it, but they started with John Collins at the five. 
which is uh, not normal. I mean, he's been, he played some five early in his career. He's played some small ball five along the way. I wasn't stunned by this because of how they've approached the Magic in recent days, playing uh, kind of you know, without a traditional back to the basket center. Obviously, Orlando is very big, like size wise, but they don't really have like that dominant post player. But they try to get the offense going a little bit. And also, as we learned after the game, Collins was limited. So he played only the five. It was only a Kongwu and Collins at the five the entire game. And uh, Nate, when I asked him, said that he wanted to keep Collins starting because even though he was limited, it's easier to kind of warm up and then stay warm if you're a starter. And then also he wanted to he also want to get Bogdanovich on the floor, on the floor as much as possible. So um, I certainly could see both sides of that. Akongu played more than Collins did, both because of the minutes and all that stuff. But um, it doesn't really matter. I'm certainly a proponent of the closing lineup matters more than the starting lineup does and all that stuff. But there was a reason, at least the method behind the Mattis for McMillan in this game. Of course, the Hawks did kind of start slowly uh, before a duck in by Collins that, that scored the first bucket of the game. But defensively, uh, it was a mixed bag throughout the night, let's just say. They allowed a couple of dunks early on. They got a little bit settled as the game went along. But when you're playing an offense-first, smaller unit, defensively, it's going to be a challenge. And quite honestly, if you just look at the player-by-player -player breakdowns of what was going to be available to the Hawks, you got Trey Young at, at the point, obviously a negative defensively. You got Murray in his first game back, probably not going to be a huge positive. Bogdanovich playing the three is a negative defender for sure. Uh, Hunter at the four is like okay, but not you know rebounding wise, etc. And then Collins at the five is probably below average for a five. So that's obviously an offense first lineup. We kind of saw that in this game. Rotationally, it was nine guys that played for the Hawks, only eight in the first quarter. Bogdanovich um, came out of the game first for AJ Griffin, and then Kongu for Collins, and then Aaron Holiday was the eighth player, and then ninth was Jalen Johnson to start the second quarter. And then, uh, as you might imagine, Jalen and Aaron were the um, eight and nine guys, and they basically only played seven for the largest swaths of this game, which makes sense. I looked at the first big run of the game with an 11 0 push in the first quarter. Um, nice three point shooting early on. DeAndre Henry had a couple of catch and shoot threes, but definitely want to see that more of that from him. I've always been banging the drum that he should be taking more catch and shoots. That happened early in the game. AJ Griffin had a three as well. They were playing fast and taking a lot of threes, which I definitely appreciated. That slowed down a little bit as the game went along. But uh, they got they had good spacing and really a good shot profile in that first half of the game, generally speaking. Um, AJ beat the buzzer for a three-pointer at the very, very end of the first quarter to go up by seven points. And the Hawks were really flying high on offense in the first period. A 136 offensive rating. They took 13 threes and eight free throw attempts. And a 10 assists, one turnover. It was beautiful stuff all, all the way across the board. Hunter had 12 points, and he, I think only had 16 in the game. Yeah, so he cooled off after that. But defensively, they definitely settled in a little bit, but it was not, a, it was not always pretty in this one. They started with Jalen Johnson in the second quarter. Um, again, Collins played only center in this game, and they and they actually had Trey and Hunter play the entire first and third quarters of this contest. They lived by as many as 13 uh, at one point in the first half, and then they played pretty much even overall in the in the Trey off the floor minutes in the first half. Uh, the Stars came back in up by five down the stretch of the first half. It got down to one at one point because the Hawks missed their first six three-point attempts in the second quarter. They went very cold. Bogey actually missed his first seven shots overall. He was better after that. But uh, I think, he, yeah, he was actually four of his last five. He was 0-7 to start the game after he made seven threes. It's basically been lights on or lights off for Bogey this year in a small sample size. But Orlando was very hot from the floor in the second quarter. In fact, the Magic shot 54% from the floor with no turnovers in the second quarter. So 38 points for Orlando. They were definitely pouring it on. And the Hawks were only up by three at the halftime break as a result, despite a 139 offensive rating. It's very hard to have a offensive rating near 140 when you don't shoot well from three, that actually happened. The Hawks, the Hawks were 621 from three in the first half and managed to have a 139 offensive rating because they were doing everything else perfectly, basically. 17 assists, four turnovers. They shot 69% on twos, 32 points in the paint. Only attempted two long twos in the entire first half. Trey had a double-double in the first half. They had five guys in double figures. Um, Murray played probably too much, 20 minutes in the first half. But generally speaking, the Hawks' offense in the first half was like what you would draw it up to be. Now, part of that is that they were playing smaller uh, without Clint. They were playing uh, only one big at a time, playing more shooters. But it really was a beautiful thing to watch for the, for the most part in the first half. Even with missed threes, they were playing very, very well against a pretty shaky defense, admittedly. But defensively, it was pretty rough. The Magic shot very well outside the paint in this game. Um, in the first half, there were 13 of 24 and all shots outside outside of the paint, which is actually you know very, very good. Um, I will say Primer defensively was not strong in this game, even though they were actually, I thought, probably a little bit unlucky as well. But they did a good job pre preventing some of the defensive glass stuff that they were probably going to have some trouble with without Capella, et cetera. But Generally speaking, it wasn't great defensively. It was definitely more of an offense-first performance on the whole, and that also applied to the first half. But still, up by three and in good shape. And as we'll get into a second, the Hawks actually played well in the second half until the final three minutes 
of the game. But we'll have more on that in a second. First, though, a word from our sponsors on, on the podcast today. Today's show is brought to you by Turo, and Turo is the world's largest car sharing marketplace. With Turo, you can book any car you want, wherever you want it, from a community of local hosts. And you can browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget. That includes across the United States, the UK, Canada, and coming soon to Australia. You can book a spacious SUV or a minivan for a fun road trip. Or if you want to have a classic or luxury car for a special event, birthday or holiday, those are available to you at Turo. And, or you can also find an, an affordable economy car if you're on a budget, you want to just get from point A to point B. It's very easy. Easy to go ahead and do that with Turo. You can also test drive an, a new electric vehicle if you have your eye on that to see how that kind of fits in your lifestyle and the way that you operate your everyday life. And many Turo hosts can even deliver the car right to you. Every trip is backed by liability insurance, terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Forget boring rental cars and find your drive at Turo.com. Early in the third quarter, the Hawks actually played very well. He had a 7 0 run to go up by 10 points. Bogey hit actually had a three after miss, missing every shot in the first half. A couple of easy buckets from Hunter, who was running the floor well. A couple of uh, nice look ahead passes from Trey Young. The Magic score, sorry, were scoreless on the first four possessions of the, of the, th- of the third quarter. And then the Hawks were definitely in control of the game. Now, Orlando did come back and uh, get it back to three at one point. Rotationally, Murray came out a little bit earlier in the first half, uh, sorry, in the third quarter than he did in the first half. That made a lot of, a lot, probably a lot of sense after he played probably two minutes, too, too many minutes, I should say, in the first half. But they stuck with only Collins or Kongwu on the floor. Um, there was a gorgeous A.J. Griffin up and under move, uh, actually into, into a scoop shot against, against Terrence Ross. That was a fun little possession, and A.J. Had a, had a quietly efficient and productive game on the wing. And then Trey Young was awesome in the third quarter. He had 17 in the third quarter. He basically had Cole Anthony in a torture rack, um, fouling and just kind of getting by him at will. He had a step back three in there as well. And Trey had 32 and 12 at the end of the third quarter. He definitely cooled off after that, as we'll get into, but certainly was brilliant in that third period with 17 points. Hawks were up by 10 at the end of the third. They shot 15 24 from the floor in the third quarter and a 130 offensive rating and uh, really cooking in terms of their passing and uh, really interior performance. In the fourth quarter, it's a little bit strange. DeJounte Murray normally is in the game anytime Trey Young is not. But because I think he played too many minutes early on in the game, they tried to sit him for the first minute of the fourth quarter. Um, I think, again, that's my guess that he was kind of overextended. The Hawks went minus five in 64 seconds without him on the floor. That was the one time of the entire game with, with no Trey, no DeJounte. They were minus five. That was a bit of a blunder. I thought they were playing both Aaron Holiday and Jalen Johnson without Trey or DeJounte. That's really kind of tough to withstand. Didn't work. Uh, I will say, though, when they brought Murray back in, it was great again. 13-5 to run. As soon as he came back in the game, they go by 13 points. Um, the Hawks did dodge a bullet, I thought, midway through the quarter. Obviously, it didn't really matter at the end. But um, there was a three by Maquero in the air. It would have made the game an eight-point game. The Hawks got a rebound, called timeout, and they put Trey back in the game. They could have put the game away, I'll say that. The Hawks were up by as um, as many as 13 in a second, as we'll get into. But there was a, possession, there was a stretch in the middle of the fourth quarter where the Hawks went empty on five out of six possessions, which is uh, not what you want, let's just say. Um, you know, still, it wasn't like it was a disaster. They had 22 points in the entire fourth quarter. But I'm looking this up now as we speak. The The way that it kind of flowed was kind of weird. They had that one explosive stretch, and then they had 117 points with seven minutes to go. So they scored nine points in the final seven, uh, in the final seven minutes. And that wasn't just the last three minutes. Basically, they, they had one long low. And then they had another long roll, uh, both in, in sort of the same seven-minute frame. Anyway, it was kind of rough. Uh, the Hawks got down – sorry, got the lead was down to seven with like four minutes to go. But then they had this little flourish, as I just as I just kind of laid out. Trey got to the line, we made an airball shot, and the Trey hits a three with three minutes to go that felt like a dagger, honestly, in the moment. Got a technical foul for drawing with, with Mo Wagner of the uh, Magic. Um, by the way, Trey was actually asked about that after the game. He said uh, he actually said that Mo Wagner was playing dirty uh, after the game, which is not something you always hear guys say on the record, but he said it. And obviously, uh, Wagner is known for speaking his mind. Uh, dating back to college, I've actually covered Mo and you know, talked about him for a long time as a Michigan guy. But um, yeah, he's definitely annoying to play against, that's for sure. And Trey did not seem to be very pleased with Mo Wagner in this game. Anyway, that was a free point for Orlando, which definitely is not great, but they were up by, even with the technical foul, they were up by 11 with three minutes to go. And also, I should say this, I thought it should be a double technical foul, if anything. Uh, Trey definitely said something to him. I'm, I'm not sure what he said, and he's he, it, it wasn't really apologetic for after the game. But uh, if you kind of watch the replay, they were tangled up a little bit on, on Wagner's end. No matter what, Hawks up by 11 points at that point. You should be winning the game 90-plus percent of the time because you're up by 11 with three minutes to go. Then... Uh, there was a block by a Kongwu that looked clean. It was called a foul, but it was actually overturned on a challenge by, by Nate. And so they're still up, and they were definitely in great shape. 
they get the ball back, etc. And then it was basically a disaster from that point forward until one second left in the game. So they basically they won the jump ball after the after the challenge miss. Then they they went empty. They fouled on the other end of the floor for some free throws. Then Dejounte turned the ball over in a pick six fashion for a dunk that put the lead down to seven. Then Murray missed a jump shot. Orlando scored again, and it was five again. So basically, the lead goes from 12 to 11 to five in about a minute and a half. Then Trey turns it over. Orlando scores again. Trey misses again. And then the Magic get a layup, and it's down to one with 29 seconds to go. So basically, the lead goes from 12 to one in about two and a half minutes. It was an 11-0 run at that point. The Hawks were empty on five sessions in a row. It was all by Trey and DeJounte. And then after the timeout, um, that the Hawks wisely called there. Trey gets an ISO. This is a tough shot. I will say, like, I saw some criticism of, of Nate McMillan on the staff. It's always kind of on the coaching staff at the end of the game. I get that. But uh, if you watch the execution, it was just bad execution all the way around. Like, I, I think the Hawks should probably run a little bit more stuff at the end of games, generally speaking. But they got some decent looks, and I thought just Trey and DeJounte played poorly. And even they admitted that. You know, Trey on the record, DeJounte said on the record as well. They didn't play well enough um, individually, collectively, and I think there was more on the players than the coaches at the end of the game, especially your stars. Both of them were very bad. Again, I want to lay this out. Six possessions, all six of them, they were 0-4 from the floor and two turnovers. All six of those things happened for Trey and Ajante, either missing shots or turning the ball over. And like, what are you going to do? And they weren't like terrible looks either. They just didn't execute well at all. Um, anyway, they get turned off the floor after, after a timeout, up by one point, but like the lead is obviously long gone at this point. They put in... Strangely, Jalen Johnson and Bogdanovich defensively. And Bogey was already out there, but he stayed in the game. I probably would have gone to Aaron Holiday in favor of Bogey. I get going to Jalen at this point. We'll come back to him in a second. John Collins was limited. He did come in one more time later, but I think he was not really quote unquote available to keep playing at that point, if I had to guess. Otherwise, he would have probably been out there ahead of Jalen Johnson. But no matter what, they blew the possession defensively. And Markel Fultz is a good athlete, got right to the rim, nice reverse layup. Um, it was Murray covering him, he was probably gassed at that point, which is also part of the calculus here. But they kind of blew the switch, and he blew right by Hunter for, uh, and there was nobody there at the rim to back him up between Kongwu and Jalen Johnson. They were spaced the floor. DeJounte said after the game when he was asked about it that they uh, were supposed to be all reds, which is, should be switching after the game. Uh, they didn't really do that hard anyway, at least not intentionally, and that was just a blown coverage by the by the two of them. But Murray said it was execution. It was not like the way that they defended it. They just didn't execute the scheme, which I think, Backed up if you watch the tape. Same thing, like more of a player breakdown than a coaching breakdown at that point in time. And then uh, after all that, it's thir- it's a 13 0 run and you're losing within a blink of an eye. Like this game is away from you in a big way. Fortunately, the shot from Fultz happened quickly enough where the Hawks had time to call timeout with like three seconds to go and to get the ball to Murray, who was fouled in the corner by, by Paolo Boncaro. Now, the replays were a little bit sketchy on this one. I thought it was a foul, just the way he had to like land on him, but I still, I, I'd love to see a better replay than I actually had. It was right in front of us, but it was like people were in the way. So, um, after all that, they get Murray to the line. Coming into that, though, I will say, they didn't, they actually brought Collins in on offense, which made me like raise my eyebrows, like why, why wasn't he in before offense, the previous possession, when Trey didn't score. Um, Trey also was the inbounder, and they have had trouble with that, and he had trouble in this game getting the ball inbounds. He's just probably a little bit too small for that role. Anyway, they did it again. I also would have played A.J. Griffin over DeAndre Hunter in that spot. That's a small nitpick, honestly, because you know Hunter versus A.J., I, I get why they wouldn't do that, but I would probably put, if it's just offense only, I think I'd prefer A.J. just for his like dynamism. He's, he's a better shooter, for instance. Anyway, um, they get it to Murray. He calmly, you know, he goes up. He misses a shot badly, but he was fouled. Um, gets to the line, makes both calmly in, in a way that a star does, and puts the Hawks ahead. But it wasn't over yet. It was about a second and a half to go. And Orlando got it to Paolo Boncaro. Uh, Boncaro uh, dribbled, which he probably couldn't do. And uh, I actually never saw a replay of this. I think the shot wasn't going to be good, even if it went in. Uh, but he missed it anyway, so it didn't really matter. And they were able to escape with that victory. But man, it was... Uh, it was a collapse. I mean, everybody talked about it. Nate said after the game they got very lucky. Trey said they had to play. They played terrible the last four or five minutes. That was his uh, quote multiple times. Murray said the same thing. They all kind of put it on them. Uh, nobody played well down the stretch. It was kind of just a mess. And uh, one of those games where like the Hawks probably deserved to blow this one, and they able to they were able to get a win. Um, coaches sometimes like teaching moments when you win because you can, you can still coach hard even though you won the game. And that's the best case scenario. This is one that was like almost too bad for that. It was like such a disaster after the game that like no one was even happy with the win. I mean, they won the game. That's obviously you take that. Nate said the same thing. But uh, it, it really was very rough. 
at the end, but uh, you know, fortunately, it's the NBA. They all uh, there's only 82 of these, and they, they all count the same in the standings. And the Hawks were able to win this one uh, despite some uh, some real real fireworks down the stretch. Um, as for the overall evaluations of the performance of the team in this one. I'll say this, the offense was really good until about three minutes to go <laughs> in the game. Uh, I, I, even before that, like maybe the last seven minutes were really, really the true like 41 minutes of the game was really awesome. They were a little bit cool for a while, but no matter what, they still, even with the disaster in the second half, uh, sorry, in the fourth quarter, especially in late in the fourth quarter, they still, with that all built in, had a 126 offensive rating. That is an elite number. Um, even against a team, and I will say this, Orlando's pretty bad defensively, uh, especially in their current form without Carter Jr. They're playing Bull Bull a lot. He's a bad defender. They're playing Mo Wagner a lot. He's a, really, he's a really bad defender. Cole Anthony is a very a very bad defender. So there's some weaknesses there for sure. But the Hawks did play well on offense until the very end. Um, 58% from, from two-point range, 38% on threes. They were 18 and 20 at the line. 62 points at the paint. It's a good number. We talked about that with, with Glenn on the show yesterday. Like, they should have got that many in this game, and they were able to do that. 29 assists, 10 turnovers, all excellent stuff across the board. The only thing that wasn't, like, great was the glass. But even then, it wasn't like it was just, like, just a zero for the Hawks either. So they played very well across the board on offense, which is uh, kudos to everybody involved, especially the first half I thought was, like, almost borderline perfect other than the bad three-point shooting. But even then, the process was really good. The guys who were shooting the shots, the shot they were getting, et cetera. Um, defensively, it was not great most of the night. A 125 defensive rating was actually a very convenient evaluation game because there was 100 possessions in this game, and uh, it makes everything very easy to sort of divide. But the Magic did win the possession battle. They won the turnover battle and the rebounding battle and the free throw attempts battle. Now, none of those were like terrible numbers for the Hawks. They just uh, were a little bit better, Orlando was. And the shooting was like fairly close. Um, I will say kudos to the Hawks. I said this on my preview on patreon.com slash BT Roland, but the magic actually their best trait is their free throw, sh- uh, their free throw um, creation, I should say on offense. And in this game, they only got 25 attempts. Now that's a good number, but it's not like a crazy number when the Hawks also had 20. So that was a good limitation without Capella. They didn't really have any foul trouble in this game. A Kong Wu, to his credit, um, did have four fouls, 28 minutes. That, that's actually fine. Kong only had one playing center. So they were able to sort of anchor that unit play a little bit smaller, and that was effective enough. But um, definitely more of an offensive first win for sure, especially through the first three and a half quarters. And uh, again, even if you build in the fourth, they were still good on offense in this one. And that was a that was sort of the uh, number one theme because, you know, Nate's prone to saying this, but I think in this case he's probably right. When you score 126 in a 100-possession game, you're supposed to win. And uh, even with that bad performance at the end, they did enough on offense. And then defensively it wasn't good, um, but they certainly uh, were able to kind of hold on for dear life and get the win at the end. All right, we'll get into the individual player breakdowns, as we always do on the podcast. But first, a word from our sponsors on the show. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online, and the NBA season is rocking and rolling here. Of course, in December, play football as well, hockey, other action that's going on in the world. That includes bowl season in the college football world, and as well as the upcoming NFL stretch run to the season. Bet Online is the number one source for all of your wedging information you're looking for. That includes stats and news and analysis this season. Get the latest odds and trends for every pro and college league out there at Bet Online. That includes football, basketball, soccer, esports, golf, tennis, auto racing, horse racing, and much more. Bet Online is also very useful, engaging the latest on the Hawks. That includes the nightly game odds and totals that I talk about on the podcast and future stuff as well. Conference odds, division odds, title odds, and then individual award stuff as well. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to get your sports betting fix. And if you love sports podcasts, you can also find those at Bet Online right now. Check out Bet Online on your mobile device, your computer, to learn more about, about the trends and the action in the sports world. Bet Online, where the game starts. Today's show is brought to you by Big Dog Speakers, and I have to ask, can, a port- can your portable Bluetooth speaker even think about hanging with the Big Dog? The Scout from Big Dog Speakers is a portable Bluetooth speaker specifically designed in Augusta, Georgia to deliver huge sound that is very clear, plus fantastic battery life, a ton of co- connectivity options, and I do it all at a competitive price. The Big Dog Scout speaker also gets loud and max volume of 105 decibels, and that's louder than competition while still maintaining that high-quality sound that you're absolutely looking for in a speaker. Or partying with your friends, blowing up the beach, or doing something more practical like making even a phone call. The Big Dog Speaker and actually is built to do it all. The Big Dog Speakers are backed by 100% satisfaction guarantee plus a one-year warranty. It's time to go big with Big Dog Speakers and the ability to charge other devices, maintain 15 hours of playback, produce up to 105 decibels, and even the ability to pair two together for an enhanced stereo sound in a waterproof package. That's the way that I have my Big Dog Speakers, by the way. They're paired together. It's an awesome feature of the service. And Big Dog Scout is also available at BigDogSpeakers.com for $99. You get 20% off as well with promo code Locked On. For more information, check out BigDogSpeakers.com. One more time, that is BigDogSpeakers.com. And don't forget to use the promo code LOCKEDON when you get there. 
All right, some uh, interesting evaluations here from a player perspective. Only nine guys played. I wasn't like shocked, but I honestly would have guessed they were going to play Kaminsky in this game still because of Orlando's size and the fact they didn't have Capella. But a DNP there, um, no Justin Holiday, no Trent Forrest, etc. They went with Aaron Holiday and Jalen Johnson in a, nine, a tight nine a rotation in this game. I thought Aaron played just fine. He had four points and two assists in ten minutes. I would have played him a little bit more probably at the very end for defensive purposes, but I thought he played well generally speaking in a small sample size. Jalen Johnson uh, was scoreless, 0-2 from the floor. Uh, three rebounds and two assists and a block. I thought he was okay too in a small sample size. Like, like he didn't play super well, but he was fine. Uh, he he didn't like you know scare me to death or anything on the floor in this game. Um, Griffin was really good off the bench. Nineteen points, seven rebounds, two assists on thirteen shots. He was definitely getting him up in this game. He was five of nine from two and three of four from three. Uh, plus fifteen. That's probably indicative to some level of that of, of the way he played. I thought he was really good in that role. Uh, Congo, I thought played pretty well as well. 11 points and eight rebounds and two blocks in 28 minutes. I would have, if, if Collins was available to play more, I think I would have gone a little bit more with Collins at center, but I, thought, I don't think he was available down the stretch. And I thought Congo did play pretty well and uh, did his job for the most part in this game, which is definitely all you can ask for out of him. Uh, Collins, speaking of, I thought was good. 12 points, seven rebounds, three assists in 20 minutes. So uh, on a normal, like, Permanent basis, he was you know probably in the neighborhood of like eighteen and ten, something like that, twenty and ten, given the way that he was limited performance wise. It was nice to see Collins in a more throwback role. If you've been a Hawks fan for a while, you may not know this. I mean, sorry, you may know this, but um, Collins used to be like the primary rim threat for this team uh, in the pre Capella era when he was playing with Dwayne Deadman or you know, Alex Lynn or whatever. He was the primary dive man and the primary pick and roll guy. And in this game, he was operating in that role as a small ball center. Now, defensively, even as well as he has played defensively this year and the, all the tries he's made defensively, um, he is better at the four than five for sure. There's a reason why he's not a full time five. It's because he's not, he does not have the size to hold up as a full time defensive five. But offensively, he's fantastic in that role. Trey talked about it after the game as well. Just like he catches everything around the rim, he's a great finisher. And uh, definitely got to see a little bit more of that in this game than they have for a while. But uh, good to see him out there. And obviously him returning is huge across the board, rebounding-wise, scoring-wise around the rim, uh, efficiency-wise, and uh, nice to see him play well. Uh, Hunter had a mixed bag game. He had 12 points in the first quarter, and then the rest of his output offensively was two layups in the beginning of the third quarter, and that was it. Um, so that was a little bit of an interesting up and down for DeAndre. He, he definitely went quiet. i like to see him take more catch-and-shoot threes for sure. Um, defensively, he was all right. I thought he did a pretty good job on, on Boncaro in this game. Um, whereas they've actually had Capella guarding Boncaro previously, when they went small in this game, they actually used Hunter on Boncaro and then you used either Collins or Kongwu on Wagner or Bowl or uh, Mubamba, which was interesting. I thought Hunter did a pretty good job on him, generally speaking. Um, and then he was just okay around uh, around the uh, the rest of the game. Two assists, four rebounds, kind of a usual DeAndre Hunter kind of line. Um, Bogdanovich was ice cold in the first half, was better in the second half. I think, he, again, he was uh, 0-7 from the floor, so it was 4-5 in the second half, including two threes. Um, 10 points. He was minus 15, and that's probably because of his shooting. His defense is a little bit shaky as well. So not, not his best game by any means, but he was better in the second half. And he was probably one of the only guys that was better in the second half, honestly. And then uh, Murray played 38 minutes. That's too many. I said it before, but he played 20 minutes in the first half right after miss missing five games. And McMillan did say it was like kind of a, a less like owner situation. He's probably not quite as limited. In fact, he wasn't limited at all, according to Nate, than Collins was. But still, you don't want to have the guy coming off of a week and a half absence and playing 20 minutes and a half, 38 minutes of the game. It's probably too many. He was gassed at the end pretty clearly, I thought. But I thought he played pretty well, gutted it out, made the free throws at the end that were huge shots, had two steals, three assists, five rebounds. He was only one of seven on threes, which is not his best shot anyway, but um, that's notable for sure. But it's nice to have him back. And obviously, he unlocks a lot of things for this Hawks team. And then uh, I thought Trey was awesome, honestly, until the very end. You know, I, you know, both Trey and DeJounte did not play well in the final five, four, six, however many minutes you want to say that is. But until then, I thought Trey was like borderline awesome and probably even better than that. 37 points in the game. 13, 13 assists, which is obviously fantastic. Um, four turnovers is totally fine for Trey and his workload. He was uh, 8 of 15 from two. That's a good number. Three of seven from three is actually good for him this year. It's actually a step forward. And then 12 of 12 at the free throw line. Uh, he cooled off late for sure with the turnovers and the sort of the lack of uh, of go. But I think you know, 32 and 12 through three quarters. This was definitely a, a more vintage Trey game. We talked about Trey a lot on yesterday's show, again, with myself and Glenn, and it all still applies. But Trey made more shots. He took some good looks, I thought, in this game. He was aggressive, hunting, and uh, good some, some sort of nice steps forward from him in this game as the Hawks will still uh, go as far as they're going to go based on how Trey plays. And uh, tonight he was more like the All-NBA guy from last season than he's been like the guy from this year. So that's good to see across the board. So 
obviously a mixed bag kind of win for Atlanta. They get the win. That is the most important thing in the NBA. You don't want to get style points. There's no coaches poll to vote in. They get the win. That's all anybody cares about. But the end of the game left a sour taste for sure. It felt like that. Everybody was not like, nobody was thrilled with this one. Usually after a win like this, there'd be a lot more celebrating that was going on. It was a lot more like exhaling in this one, which I get. And that was part of the deal here, but they got the win anyway, which is nice. Um, from here, they actually stay at home. They play the Bulls on Wednesday, and that's a pretty uh, favorable matchup on paper. The Bulls are not playing well at all right now. And also, they play, um, and it's actually they're playing in Miami on Tuesday. So a, another situation where the Hawks are well-rested and at home against a team on a back-to-back with travel. So a very nice schedule there. Also, they, of course, beat the Bulls last week on the Griffin buzzer beater, and the Bulls, again, are kind of in free fall. So that's a good matchup for Atlanta. We'll see if Capella is anywhere close to being back by then. But um, the fact that they got through this game with DeJounte and Collins back and seemingly uh, at full strength or close to it, that's a huge development because this team does not have a ton of depth. But if they're back in at full strength, they are good. And I do believe that, especially when they, once they get Capella back. So uh, a mixed bag coming tonight for sure for Atlanta. I always uh, want to give you the nuance on this podcast. It wasn't all great. It wasn't all terrible. The ending was more player related. I thought the, the coach related. Uh, Trey was awesome in this one. There's definitely lots of cliff notes, but um, a nice win overall for Atlanta, even if it was not the way that you would have uh, liked to have that happen down the stretch. All right, that's it for me on this podcast. Please subscribe to the show. It does a uh, does wonders for us, honestly. Across the board, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Odyssey, etc. Uh, as far as scheduling for this week is concerned, I uh, might pop in in between games, but I will definitely guarantee a show after each of the games this week. We're into the Christmas holidays, so it'll probably take a little bit of time. I'll be traveling later on in the week as well, so uh, just be patient on that front uh, as far as the uh, recording quality, but I will do my best always to have podcast fodder for you. If anything breaks, I will jump into the mix and talk about it. But I do surprise. I do sorry. I do thank you for listening to the podcast and subscribing. And please do us a favor as well and spread the word about the show. Follow us on Twitter at Lots on Hawks. Follow me on Twitter at BT Roll. I'm also writing about the Hawks again. It's Patreon.com/slash BT Roll. So spread the word about that as well. Thanks for listening, everybody. As always, and we'll see you all later on this week.